Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I think we are taking meaningful major steps. Erasing symbols that exemplify a racist past. I am optimistic that as we move through this process, there will be a light at the end of the tunnel. So many problems yet finding hope for the state's energy sector. Do you know somebody who's tested positive? Do you know someone who's died? An LSU survey gets responses about living with coronavirus. When you have a large percentage of students in high school, not just girls, but large percentage of students who don't even know what an engineer does. Educating and attracting students, especially girls, to high paying careers in STEM. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, the latest numbers regarding coronavirus in our state. Right now, the total number of coronavirus cases in Louisiana is approaching 45,000, 2,883 deaths and 549 hospitalized. And now let's check on other headlines that are making news around the state. As more businesses reopen around the state, the governor worries too many people are ignoring public health coronavirus guidelines, that they're letting down their guard, especially in restaurants, grocery stores and gatherings. He says too many are interpreting his loosening of restrictions to mean the virus outbreak is over. He says if that were true, there would be no restrictions. Health leaders say there's a disconnect in the contact tracing process. Those who don't answer calls from a number they don't recognize could be missing calls from a contact tracer. So far, only 50 percent of people being called for contact tracing are picking up the phone. Video uncovered this week appears to show Shreveport police repeatedly punching and tasing a black man they were arresting shortly before he died in police custody. The video shows the April 5th altercation between Tommy McLaughlin and four officers. The McLaughlin family and a lawyer describe the death as homicide and want police to face murder charges. Shreveport's DA is investigating and the police have been put on leave. UL Monroe has fired an instructor and is taking steps to fire a professor for social media posts that it described as stunningly bigoted and racist. A brief statement Tuesday says both are on administrative leave. Other personnel issue details are not released. The ULM faculty handbook defines expectations for faculty behavior in regards to citizenship and civility. The week began with Tropical Storm Cristobal impacting southeast coastal Louisiana with minimal storm surge and rain. Lopsided in nature, it had 50 mile per hour winds when it made landfall Sunday between Grand Isle and the mouth of the Mississippi River. Its real impact was farther east along the Mississippi and Alabama coasts. Tornadoes caused damage in Florida. And here's a look at the news that made headlines at the state capitol this week. The Louisiana State Treasurer is pushing to get money for the state's small businesses. State Treasurer John Schroeder spoke with several state business leaders Tuesday to urge Governor John Bell Edwards to sign Senate Bill 189 that would free up $300 million to the Main Street Recovery Program bill. This money comes from the CARES Act and was earmarked for cities as a part of the pandemic relief. The funds could help up to 100,000 businesses that have not received financial assistance from the federal government. The way I see it, um, if business doesn't come back, thrive, put people to work, put food on their tables, spend money, then, then the same revenue that government needs to survive is not going to be there. So it's critical. The federal aid would go to Louisiana-owned businesses with 50 or fewer employees. The Louisiana House unanimously agreed Wednesday to a $34 billion operating budget for next year that includes hundreds of millions in federal coronavirus aid Many lawmakers concerned, though, about future tax collections uncertainties and disagreeing over hospital payments. 
The spending plan for the financial year would begin July 1st and would keep most programs and services from cuts by plugging gaps with temporary federal funds that Louisiana, like other states, is receiving in response to the COVID-19 disease caused by the coronavirus. But lawmakers acknowledge they have concerns about what happens a year later when the temporary federal stopgap aid disappears. Before they agreed to a proposal study on policing in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, white lawmakers on Louisiana's House Committee Wednesday stripped a reference to Floyd and language questioning the criminal justice system's treatment of racial minorities. Representative Ted James' efforts to create a 19-member study group to review Louisiana's law enforcement systems and policing methods sparked strong reaction in the House and Governmental Affairs Committee. Several white lawmakers describing the legislation's original language as offensive when describing the deaths of black men at the hands of white police officers in recent years and referencing the death of Floyd in Minneapolis. Vaping with a child in a car will soon be illegal in Louisiana. Louisiana law already prohibited drivers and passengers from smoking cigarettes, pipes, or cigars if a child is in a vehicle. A bill by Gretna Representative Joe Marino adds vaping to that list. Governor John Bell Edwards announced Tuesday that he'd signed the measure into law. It will take effect in August. Louisiana Republicans hope they've ended the upheaval surrounding elections for their governing body by having lawmakers rewrite the rules determining the makeup of the GOP's Central Committee districts. Bills passed by a near-unanimous House and Senate vote in the regular legislative session would keep the Republican Party from having to follow 1980s-era law that would have dramatically reworked its state Central Committee districts and forced some current members to run against one another. A week from today, the LSU Board of Supervisors will meet to consider the removal of the name Troy H. Middleton from the LSU Library. It's a move Governor John Bell Edwards supports. It is just one piece of a plan LSU leaders and student leaders announced as both sides worked independently and then together on roadmaps to diversity. During the week, a racist tweet from an incoming LSU student sparked outrage. Much more happened, too. I talked with LSU President Tom Galligan. We are living in the 21st century and we are an inclusive community and we condemn racism. But when places or the way places are organized have badges of past racism, what we have to do is we have to try to the best we can to eradicate those connections. A takeaway point would be that the students have mourned an ongoing national tragedy, which continued racially motivated or, or racially influenced violence. And they have seized upon that and they've taken their mourning and they've turned it into an agenda for action. The student who posted the speech on Twitter and there was like, oh, he shouldn't be allowed into school how, how do you address that with free speech and all that? Yeah, it's a really tough question. Um, and um, I, I, will, I will pledge that we will investigate every racist act that we see, that we hear, that's reported to us. And we will take, we'll investigate and if appropriate, take action under our, our student judicial codes, our student codes of conduct. It certainly appears that LSU is seriously <laughs> taking care of this and, and taking meaningful major steps to address this. We are, I think we are taking meaningful major steps. Um, and as I've been saying all week to everybody who listen, um, action speaks louder than words. And it, it, is, it is again time for action. We want our image to be our reality. And our reality is an inclusive, welcoming place. So if, if our physical spaces, if our art if doesn't reflect our reality, then we're, we're not projecting who we really are. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Yeah, Andre, thank you very much. The Middleton family is responding to the expected change, saying removing the name is a dishonorable erasure of state history. A family statement reads, General Troy Middleton was an American hero and Louisiana icon. We denounce the university's plan to remove his name and memorials for the library he raised money to build. 
Middleton was the president of LSU from 1951 to 1962, and the controversy with continuing his legacy stems from comments he made in a 1961 letter to the former University of Texas Chancellor Harry Ransom, including that LSU still kept black students in a given area. I talked this week with the executive director of LSU's Center for Energy Studies, David Dismukes. The energy boom we saw most of the past decade, especially with LNG projects, is over. And he says things are not good. So why does he say the worst is behind us? Here's our conversation. For us over the last eight years or so, uh, as you know, we've had billions upon billions of investments that have been made here. And most of that David Dismukes is a go-to guy in the world of information about energy. Whether offshore, onshore, exploration, or production, he's analyzed trends and given expert opinions for three decades. The current global oil ordeal, coupled with a world pandemic, has thrown Louisiana's energy outlook into chaos. When you look at the price of oil a little bit back at minus 37, how did you respond to that? Uh, it's amazing. I remember exactly, you know, you remember where you are at these certain points of time in history. And I remember looking at that and, and making a picture, a screenshot of this saying, you're never going to see something like this again. And sending it off to a couple of colleagues of mine in the oil and gas business and some other researchers that... You know, this is unheard of, and it, it was phenomenal. It, it, there had been discussions prior to that happening about the possibilities of it potentially happening, but just to sit there and watch it unfold in real time was, it was quite an experience and quite an, an unique. He says the lull in industrial construction after record expansion could stretch out for several years, and some won't survive it. But I think you've said there is uh, some good news to this, but extreme patience will have to be used. Yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately we will come out of this cycle, uh, uh, believe it or not, stronger and potentially more profitable than we were before from, from a state perspective in terms of development. Uh, a lot of efficiencies are going to have to be generated for a lot of these companies to survive through what I would argue the real critical point, which is getting out of the, this year and kind of getting past 2020 and making it into a new year. Most economic forecasts that we're looking at right now, most outlooks tend to suggest that we'll be turning back up. Well, we're already in that process of recovery and it will start to be much stronger as we move through the end of the year into the beginning of next year. So surviving until we can get to the end of this year is the big challenge. Because the boom was big for the plants themselves and all the players related, like the engineering firms and the lawyers, the downturn means trouble across the board. And we've already seen uh, layoff announcements not only just locally, but just globally with big energy companies. Um, I think BP announced yesterday something like 10,000 jobs that they were going to eliminate. Uh, Chevron is looking at somewhere around 6,000. Uh, I think Schlumberger had uh, announced 1,000. These are really big layoffs that you know, are, are big percentages of their labor and workforce. And what about in that Lake Charles region with the billion-dollar investment here and billion-dollar investment there? So yeah, that's that's away. the advantage and the disadvantage of those big investments is that when they go away, it's a it's a big impact, right? And so most of those are several billion dollars a pop when you're looking at the LNG export facilities, and that is a sector of the energy business right right now that is really taking it on the chin pretty badly. It leaves questions: How will the state make up for the oil revenues it depends upon? And could what's happening now factor into an eventual shift toward a cleaner carbon footprint? Say I'm um, with Greenpeace or something and I'm coming into Louisiana and I see all the oil and gas and everything happening and I want to launch a campaign to move more toward um, clean energy. How do you respond to that? Well, I think it's a great question. And, and that is a, a, the, these, what we refer to as ESG, uh, the environmental, social and governance issues have been a big issue for corporate America and in particular for the oil and gas industry. And prior to these COVID, the COVID situation, that was probably what I would argue, probably one of the front and center concerns and challenges that oil and gas companies were having. And many of them were addressing it. And I would be a little cautious about trying to do that in the middle of a catastrophe. I think there are times for doing that and times for not doing that. And when somebody's kind of down on the ground, uh, kicking them a little bit might not be the best, best medicine in all this. But I think continuing to think about this is something that these corporations are pretty well aware of right now.
Researchers at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication found that as Louisiana moves to reopen parts of its economy, people are moving more frequently in their communities. They've got anxieties about public health and the economy, but remain cautious about re-engaging into life as they knew it. Manship researchers conducted the survey in April and again in May, interviewing the same people, comparing their responses between months. With this survey, what stands out to you? I think the one that really jumps off the page is just the, um, uh, the social reach of the pandemic in Louisiana. Um, we know it's been a hot zone. A, a lot of people have, have uh, you know, been directly impacted and been infected with COVID, um, but we're actually seeing what that means in terms of how many people know those people and how many people in the state um, are personally, you know, know somebody who has either contracted the disease or, or died from complications related to it. The survey found 42 percent of Louisianans knew someone testing positive for COVID-19 and 23 percent knew someone who died. But the impact was far greater on the African-American population. And our numbers are bearing that out. I mean, we have you know, half of black residents of Louisiana know, personally know somebody who has tested positive. And, you know, something close to just, you know, 40 percent know someone who has died from complications related to the disease. In contrast, you know, among among white residents of the state, that that latter share is just 17 percent, which is I mean, that's a big number, too. But it's less than half um, as what we of what we see among black residents of the state. Maybe not surprisingly, uh, it seems to show a political divide uh, with a virus that really is an equal opportunity offender. And although the, the partisan differences don't permeate to, to every question, um, but we're, we do see them growing on some in particular that just wasn't there in the same way in April. So we're seeing bigger partisan differences in you know, support for how quickly we should reopen. We see bigger partisan differences on whether or not the worst is behind us or the worst is yet to come. And we're starting to see some partisan differences in behavior too, things like wearing masks, I mean, we didn't really see many behavior, differences in behavior just a month before. Here's what the numbers show about activities outside of a person's home. A majority, 77 percent, say they are uncomfortable getting on an airplane. 75 percent uncomfortable going to a large sporting event. 60 percent uncomfortable eating out at a restaurant. Did you ask in such a way for those people who know people, did it change their behavior? No, we didn't. We actually asked towards the, we did ask a number of questions about uh, their behavior, um, but we did not ask them the reasons they may or may not have changed their behavior um, for a couple of reasons. One is people are pretty, pretty good about describing how they feel about things, how they think about things, um, but they're not all, they don't always provide the most accurate representations of the cause, why, um, why they may have done it uh, one way or the other. The researchers have secured funding to continue their survey several months ahead as they continue to track how people are living through the pandemic. How do you encourage girls at a young age to think about careers in some of the highest paid jobs in the country? Science, technology, engineering and math or STEM careers have long been somewhat of an afterthought for many women, but some local scientists are working with state officials to change that. And this week, LPV gets on board with the program taking STEM activities virtual. Louisiana State Senator Sharon Hewitt hasn't always been making speeches on the House floor of the state legislature. This photo shows the young LSU engineer on the job with the Shell Corporation, one of the first women to work on an offshore drilling rig. She says her early years as a mechanical engineer were not without serious challenges. I can tell stories about um, having to tie bathroom doorknobs together with a rope because there weren't any private facilities for women and I had to kind of barricade my my way in to be able to take a shower on an offshore you know drilling rig and and women have no idea some of the the things that that those of us that were kind of on the frontier end of this were willing to do. Senator Hewitt says she was just determined to prove herself. When I was young in my career I just considered it what it took to get the job done and I wanted to to compete and to be considered a uh, of my skills and, and the work ethic that I had and what I brought to the job. 
Those early challenges, even obstacles, helped her develop laws and policies to grow STEM programs in local schools, especially programs geared to encourage girls to pursue STEM. Act 392 back in 2017 created the Last STEM Advisory Council. Well, that's one of the reasons why this is so important to me. I, I'm an engineer and I grew up in the oil and gas industry in the 80s when women really were not in the oil and gas industry. I, I started out on a drilling rig and was pretty much the only female that anybody had ever seen. And, and so I can appreciate the importance of role models and in encouraging young girls to consider non-traditional paths. An annual event used to encourage young Louisiana girls to get excited about STEM is going virtual this year because of the pandemic. LPB is taking girls on a virtual road trip to the museum with the help of a number of female LSU scientists, a tie-in to an upcoming PBS three-part series, Prehistoric Road Trip. Dr. Cynthia Peterson is the dean of the LSU College of Science. We're super excited to be involved and be partnering with LPB on this event. Um, you know, when I talk to um, prospective students who are going to, you know, think about coming to LSU, talk to students and parents, I emphasize that science is doing. You know, science is not about just a bunch of facts. It's really about doing. And so that's um, a, an element that, or the key element, right, in this mini series with some hands-on activities for girls that will engage them from the very beginning. And I, you know, I think that's the way people develop a passion is by doing with their own hands and understanding that science is active. And although studies throughout the country show girls still lag behind their male counterparts in STEM careers, for those who do show early interest in elementary school, they seem to lose interest by the time they enter high school and go on to college. One of the things we've been involved in um, at LSU and the College of Science are um, activities for different ages of girls, focusing um, very young, you know, K through three, then then a slightly different set of activities for girls in fourth through sixth grade, and then age appropriate activities for seventh through nine, and then you know high school, um, and. All of it is, goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, though. It's, it's very much about um, un, um, helping girls understand the, the fun that, that is doing science and engaging them hands-on. I think the other very important aspect is providing role models. And so, you know, so in all of our events, we um, provide women who are in science as role models, just letting them get to know us personally um, and, and talking about our career paths too. LSU professor Dr. Sophie Warney stresses another problem preventing girls or most anyone in Louisiana schools from learning about one area of science in particular. The curriculum in Louisiana, but uh, pretty much you don't teach geology uh, in K through 12 in Louisiana. Uh, it's touched a little bit upon on, you know, for one of the grade, but it's essentially in high school and want to go into science. If, you know, uh, we are lucky that they want to go into science, think about chemistry, biology, med school, you know, engineering. But we have very, very little kids thinking about geology. And she says that means many jobs in the field go unfilled. We feel it's really tragic for our field because we need a lot of geologists. Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, in Louisiana, the oil and gas industry has a lot of, um, you know, power of employment. But uh, right now, you know, with the downturn, maybe less so. But uh, there is so much other field like um, environmental research, uh, you know, a lot of places where uh, kids can, can find excellent job. And we definitely do not have enough children going into geology right now. Doctors Warney, Peterson and Senator Hewitt are all working together to change that. Over the last... Um, 20 years, there's been really a significant change. And so um, what we've seen over that time period that is that, you know, women have moved into health careers that are very well represented there. Um, women are pretty well represented in life sciences in terms of, of careers. But then when you start getting to math, physical science, engineering, computer science, presentation of women in those in those areas. So I think it's absolutely critical that we 
continue to have role models and can continue to help girls understand what those careers are. We're working right now in this current budget year to get funding for regional STEM centers. And so those will be nine different areas around the state uh, where industry and higher education institutions and economic development organizations, our K through 12 schools, will all partner together to work together to identify what are the workforce gaps and the, and the needs from an education standpoint. Unfortunately, LPB's girls' virtual road trip is totally booked. There are no more slots available. For a sneak peek screening of the prehistoric road trip, it's tomorrow, June 13th at 1030 to 12 on LPB. The first episode of the series, Prehistoric Road Trip, airs Wednesday, July 17th at 9 p.m. Sounds like, looks like some good stuff. Yeah, some good programming. Well, that's our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news, public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.